So now we talk about a few properties. First, I'm going to make a claim. Every field is an integral domain. How do we prove this? What is the only property? See, both of them start with the structure of a commutative ring, right? The thing is, the field is a commutative division ring, but the integral domain is not a commutative division ring. Instead, it has some nice property. What is that? That product of non-zeros can never be zero. So we have to see that if it's a division, if it's a commutative division ring, then that automatically implies that extra property which we embedded in the integral domain. So suppose something is a field, then obviously every element other than zero has an inverse. So here's a sketch of the proof. I mean, all these proofs mostly will sketch. So suppose A into B is equal to zero. All right. If A is not equal to zero, then what can we say? There exists A inverse. Right? Clear on this? There exists A inverse such that A inverse A is equal to 1. So let us hit this with A inverse from the left on both sides. So we get A inverse A and we can put these brackets because of associativity times B is equal to A inverse times 0. Okay. We haven't still shown that, you know, there's no point in seeking an added uh, multiplicative inverse to the 0 element. Let's do a rough sketch of that proof as a sub part of this because we'll have to now use the fact that this is going to be 0. Seems funny, right? You multiply something by 0, you take it for granted it's 0. Requires a proof as it turns out. So how do we start that? So let's take 0 times alpha. Say alpha belongs to some field. Okay. So f stands for some field. By the way, you can also write f with the operations. But when the operation is clear from the context, we just write the set itself. So f is in this case our set along with some conventional operations that meet the criteria for a field. So we'll just write f. Every single time we won't append it with those two binary operations and then put it in a bracket as a three tuple. So this, look, I'm just going to use only the properties that my algebra allows me to do. What I'm going to write is this is 0 plus 0. And what property am I using here? The existence of the additive identity. So 0 is equal to 0 plus 0, quite simply because 0 is its it's everybody's additive identity. It's a unique additive identity for every element. So it is also its own additive identity. Yeah. So therefore, this is 0. Now, this implies that 0 into alpha is equal to. So this I'm going to now change. What am I going to do? Distributivity, right? So this is 0 times alpha plus 0 times alpha. Now, because I know that there must exist an additive inverse to every element, and because it is closed under multiplicative uh, multi multiplication, so all of these elements also belong to the field. So therefore, these are elements of the field and therefore each of them must have an additive inverse. So let me just put that additive inverse on both sides. Yeah, minus 0 times alpha. So this is basically the symbol for the additive inverse. Let's you know just write it in this, that manner. Plus 0 alpha is equal to plus 0. And then I am again going to use associativity on this side. So now an element added with its additive inverse gives me 0 back again. So therefore, this is 0. This is also by the same token 0, 0 plus 0. But this is again because of additive identity. Please fill out the properties in between. I have not written at which step which property I have used. I leave that to you to fill it out at every step. What properties from that set of properties that I had written down a while back am I using at every step? Please note that. 
right. So, this means that 0 acting on any alpha in the field will always result in 0. So, therefore, there is no point in seeking the added the multiplicative inverse of 0 you see because no matter what 0 gets to act on it turns it to 0. So, that is why it makes sense to look for only multiplicative inverses of non-zero elements. So, therefore, harnessing that property here, what can we say? This is also 0 and this is 1. So, this is 1 times b is equal to 0 implying b must be equal to 0. The proof is not complete, it is a mere exercise now to assume as a second step that b is not equal to 0 and therefore b inverse must exist and hit it with b inverse on the right on both sides and again proceed accordingly and conclude that a must be equal to 0. So, that is what is going to lead you to the completion of the proof. So, either a is equal to 0 or b is equal to 0. Of course, if both are 0 then it is trivial to show that it is 0. Yeah, you could. <laughs> So, of course, that is that is the way, I mean, but what I am meaning to say is that at this stage it is not yet complete, you have to write a couple of lines more, somehow justify that every time you start with something that is in a field, yeah, that field must also satisfy the properties of an integral domain. Unfortunately, not every integral domain happens to be a field, right, that is definitely there. For example, you take the set of integers, yeah, there is multiplicative inverses are not integers themselves except for 1 and minus 1, right. So, there still is some hope though, okay. It is not a complete lost cause because the second one says and this is where things start getting interesting. Every finite integral domain is a field. Now, that is interesting. When you talk about the set of integers, it is an infinite integral domain. Maybe that is the defect. Does that mean every infinite integral domain is not a field? Of course not. There are infinite fields and by definition fields are integral domains. So, of course, infinite fields are also infinite integral domains. So, it is not necessarily true that infinite integral domains cannot be fields. But some in infinite integral domains probably are not fields because of this assertion which says that if it is a finite integral domain, then it must be a field. So, again what do we start with? We only start with what we know of integral domains to be true. Every other property is kind of overlapping except for the fact that in integral domain you have product of two non-zeros must be non-zero. So, in case of the finite, what is so special that tells us that every element must have a multiplicative inverse unless it is 0, okay. So, let us try and see a, again a quick sketch of a proof. Consider S is equal to say A1, A2 dot 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 till An because it is a finite field you see with some addition and multiplication to b an integral domain okay so it's a finite integral domain now the claim is that this must be a field which means that any object that you pick out from these n fellows here must necessarily have a multiplicative inverse that is essentially what this claim boils down to okay so, further choose any alpha belonging to S and consider S tilde to be the following set alpha A1, alpha A2 alpha a n. It is a new set S tilde. Alpha could be any of these a 1s through a n. I am not saying which one it is. 
but it can only have finite number of possibilities because there are only n distinct elements in that set S. So, you take any one of those n distinct elements and call it let us say alpha and then you cook up a new set which is just the products according to the usual multiplication rules that are defined in this particular integral domain. Okay. Look at alpha a i minus alpha a g for i not equal to g. Okay. What I am going to claim is that this cannot be 0. Okay. Let us see alpha so suppose alpha a i minus alpha a j is equal to 0 which implies that alpha a i minus a j is equal to 0 and I immediately I am saying have a contradiction. What is that contradiction? Let me just make one small little change here because I am not interested in the multiplicative inverse of 0. So, I am going to pick out this alpha to be a non-zero. So, if alpha is non-zero and this product is 0 and it is an integral domain, what do I immediately have? That a i must be equal to a j. Why is that a contradiction? Because these are distinct elements. But if these are distinct elements, then what have I just proved? That the elements of S tilde that I have enlisted here must also be distinct. Yeah. So, fill out that. Why is it a contradiction? I have said in words. It is up to you to fill that out. So, this is a contradiction. So, therefore, this cannot be 0 is the assertion if this cannot be 0 then this means elements of S tilde are distinct. How many elements are there in S tilde? N elements. How many elements are there in the integral domain? So, there is the by the pigeon hole principle what can we say? one of the elements in S tilde must correspond to the must correspond to which element am I looking for? The multiplicative identity right. Therefore, one of the elements in S tilde must be 1 and I am done. Because if it is so, then I have actually explicitly found out which element which when multiplied with alpha gives me 1 and that is in itself the multiplicative inverse of alpha. So, no matter what alpha you pick from this set, if you can carry out this multiplication operation, you are sure to find out one element which takes you to 1. And therefore, alpha times a k is equal to 1 for some k belonging to the set 1, 2, dot, dot, dot till n. Therefore, there exists alpha inverse is equal to a k in S, which means that for a non-zero alpha, if you are assured that there is a multiplicative inverse, this thing that we started with an integral domain, a finite integral domain must necessarily also be a field. So, the only way an integral domain fails to be a field is if it is infinite, but that does not mean that if it is infinite it cannot be a field because infinite fields are classic examples of infinite integral domains, right. But finite integral domains means it must be a field, right, okay. Yes, because there are n distinct elements in S tilde, they are all distinct. 
and these are all members of what because these are by uh, these are by multiplication so these must also come from the set s and s has only n distinct elements so there are n distinct elements which must be equal to n distinct elements here and this set s must have the multiplicative identity yeah because it's an integral domain it must have a multiplicative identity so at least one of these fellows must map to that identity multiplicative identity and that is the fellow I mean that particular AK is going to be the multiplicative inverse of alpha which is all we needed in order to show that this is a field. That's, the, that's just a symbol. So 1 is depending on the operation that 1 can be, so 0 can be equal to 1. If you define your operation in such a way, if you call your addition as your multiplication, of course you cannot because <laughs> there are difficulties there but you know. So that 1 is just a placeholder, do not look at 1, I, as I said square root of 2 and square root of 3, the ones examples that I gave you the other day, right? You should not read them as 1.414 or 1.732. Define your parameters or these objects according to the number system and the rules that we have given. Do not think of them in the conventional sense. Okay. So hopefully this proof is clear, right? That is exactly what I have shown. I have taken any two arbitrary elements in S tilde, call them alpha ai and alpha aj and I showed that if they have to be equal to 0, then ai must be equal to aj because alpha is not 0. It is an integral domain, product of two numbers is 0, therefore one of them must be 0, alpha cannot be 0, so ai minus aj must be 0. If ai minus aj must be 0, then ai and aj are equal, but ai and aj by my claim, which I have now erased in that set S are distinct elements of S, so that is a contradiction. Right? Okay. Next. We will also look at another interesting property. Now that we are dealing with these finite integral domains and we saw that they are fields, what kind of finite sets with these modulo operations do turn out to be integral domains and therefore fields? Right? So, suppose Zn is equal to 0, 1, 2, n minus 1, yeah, and you define Zn with addition modulo n and multiplication modulo n, right? The claim is that this is an integral domain. Now once it is finite, whether I say integral domain or field by this previous assertion is the same thing, is an integral domain or field if and only if, that is a sufficient and necessary condition, if and only if, any guesses and if you have encountered this, n is a prime number, n is prime. We will devote some time to this, okay. We will try to see this at least one part of it in two different ways, okay. And that is going to be important because much later in the course we shall be using one of those tools that we develop in this proof, yeah. So one part will be quite straightforward. If you take it to be composite, what needs to be shown is that it cannot be an integral domain or a field and that should be very apparent. If n is a composite number, then n can be factorized in more ways than one. One way is obviously n times one, yeah. But if n is composite, there must be some other factors also. So if you take these two other factors, these are non-zero factors, right? And these are non-zero factors and yet when you multiply them, they lead to n, so n modulo n is 0. So you already have non-zeros multiplying to give you 0. So if n is composite, then it is not an integral domain and one part is done. So n being prime is a necessary condition. So that only if is done, right? 
So let us just look at the only if part. I will just write it formally. Suppose n is composite, there exists, this implies that there exists um, q and s such that n is equal to q s, okay, let us say q and s belonging to, uh, let us call this set as s. Oh, z, we have already given it a name, sorry, my bad, it is already z n. Yeah. So, q and s, if it is composite, you must have this property. Yeah. Therefore, when you look at the multiplication operation, q times s modulo n is equal to 0, but q and s are not equal to 0. Hence, not an integral domain, right? This is clear, right? It cannot be an integral domain if it is a composite number. So, if you are looking for a finite field subject to these operations, there is no way that if you choose n to be a composite number, it is going to be a field or a integral domain. But the other part still remains to be shown. So, okay, here, here goes. Where should I erase now? Maybe you know these assertions well. So, let's go. so suppose n is prime. Right. Uh, consider any alpha belonging to Z n and look at the following set alpha, alpha squared, alpha cubed till some alpha m, alpha n, m plus 1, likewise. I'm not saying this is necessarily finite. What will happen? If you keep looking at these, this is cooked up by successive multiplications which are well defined. Yeah, so we are at least assured that this multiplication is well defined, there is no ambiguity. What are we guaranteed? Because it is a finite set, what can we say? But if we are going on taking higher and higher powers, so for some L comma K, we must have A, oh sorry, alpha to the L is equal to alpha to the K with k minus l greater than 1. Think about it. Can it be equal to 1? Can you have something alpha to the power something? Yeah. And then you multiply it with alpha and then it is equal in the modulo sense. It is a prime number remember. Alpha is a number that is smaller than the prime number. You are just multiplying this alpha multiple times and you are dividing it by p to take the modulo. The p is irreducible because it is a prime number. So, factors of alpha even if, the, even if alpha is not a prime number which it need not be, but the factors of alpha cannot combine to give you p. So, that is also indivisible, right? it is irreducible. Yeah. So, therefore, if you just enhance k by 1 from L, right, if you just take k is equal to L plus 1, can it just give you like a number and that number multiplied by another number smaller than the prime number? Modulo p, the prime number, can they be the same? They cannot, right. 
So, it must be more than one, but at the same time you will run out of possibilities because there is only a finite number of fellows here. Yeah, you are, you are looking at a potentially infinite set. So, I mean at most beyond n entries you are likely to repeat, you, are, you have to repeat, right. So, this must be true which means that we have taken that k is greater l is smaller. So, alpha to the l 1 minus alpha to the k minus l is equal to 0. Again I should probably just clarify a bit here. Yeah. because obviously we are looking for non-zero elements, yeah. So then what happens? From this we use the same tool as before reminiscent of what we have done just a while back. What do you know about this? Can this be 0 modulo p modulo any prime number? This alpha is smaller than the prime number and you just going on multiplying it multiple times, multiple times and then taking its uh, division I mean its remainder with respect to division by the prime number. Just if you if you have difficulty in figuring this out, take prime number say 5 or 7 whatever comes to mind. Take any number smaller than that prime number say 4. So, you are taking 7. So, you have numbers from 0 to 6 and you are taking 4. You keep multiplying 4 multiple times. Can you divide it by can you divide it by 7 and get 0? Because the multiples of 4 I mean take powers of 4 they will never contain a factor 7 it cannot right. So, this cannot be 0 right. So, let us continue here, but alpha to the L is not equal to 0. So, I have I hope I have justified that why. Therefore, what do we say? 1 must be equal to alpha to the k minus L minus 1 times alpha and we are done because this remember k minus L is greater than 1. So, k minus L minus 1 is greater than 0. So, this is not a unit yeah this means that alpha inverse is equal to alpha raised to the k minus L minus 1. So, any time you pluck out a non-zero element yeah from this when n is a prime number you are guaranteed to have its inverse within that set right. Remember this is not just raised to this power, but you have to also look at it modulo p that is the important thing because all these operations are okay I have called it n. So, modulo n where n is a prime number right. So, if it is not prime it cannot be a field if it is prime every element must have a multiplicative inverse. So, it must be a field right there is another way in which we will prove this latter part, but that is again part of the next module.